I wanted to ask you, obviously, with the news coming out of the awards, uh, first of all, what it means to you to, to be named Coach of the Year and in, in first year in this conference, and then obviously the, the accolades going to your players uh, uh, for all the hard work they put in. Uh, just initial reaction to that accomplishment, and then I had a, a follow-up as well. Uh, but if you could begin with that, that would be great. Yeah. Um, just proud of our guys. Um, you know, you know, one of the biggest challenges is uh, to bring your attitude and effort uh, and intensity and the things that is important to our program on a daily basis. You know, mo most kids, that's outside their comfort zone. That's not easy for them to do. But for us, you have to do it. You know, uh, when I walk into the gym every day, um, I don't do it literally, but in a way I do. I take my my two uh, index fingers and I just kind of put it in, in, on my wrist to feel their pulse. You know, whether I'm reading their body language or how they're going about stuff, you can tell the ones that's going to need a little bit extra attention uh, today. And the guys that can start doing it on a daily basis um, uh, without without my help, if you will, uh, those those are the guys that learn to play Cougar basketball. They, they've bought into our culture. And the guy that probably struggled with that the most, the most inconsistent guy with that early on was probably Jamal. Uh, Jamal turned the corner when I didn't have to take my key and stick it in his ignition and turn him on. You know, if I have to do that for you every day, then that's a problem for you. Because um, I'm not going to do it every day. At some point, you have to take your key, stick it in your ignition, start your own engine. Javier struggled with that. Uh, JoJo struggled with that. They all did. Devin Davis, uh, Fabian, um, um, uh, Rob Gray. I mean, I can go back. Uh, Damian Dawson was infamous for that. But you, you get them to the point where they can start their engines uh, every day. And once they do, then you can find out how good uh, you can be. And that's, uh, those are, those are non-negotiables and uh, how we approach our business. Um, uh, it's just the way it is here. And uh, when Jamal got consistent with that, he started realizing that he was, you know, some people say, well, he's maturing, he's growing up. I don't care what you call it. Um, um, but, what I see is those those kids that learn how to uh, be held accountable and hold yourself accountable. And when he did that, only then could he start leading other people. You know, if, if you're not doing it yourself, then uh, I'm not I'm not interested in you leading. Matter of fact, I don't want to hear your voice. You know, clean your own closet before you start worrying about mine. Uh, so uh, that that is when Jamal took off and um, and. Um, you know, that's why kids need to stay. Don't don't run at the first sign of trouble. Things don't go your way. The answer is not always to go take it somewhere else because you can you can change addresses all you want, but you can't change yourself. So Jamal changed himself. He learned to take his ignition. Then he learned to lead and learned team learned to respect him. And then what you saw him become with his talent was the player of the year in the Big 12. And because he bought into our defense so much, because of his consistent every day in practice, he became the defensive player of the year. But he had those abilities, um, and, and he brought it out. Uh, J1 Roberts is uh, personifies winning. Uh, everybody has a different definition of what a winner is. I have zero interest in that. I have my definition, and he is a winner. Um, uh, LJ Pryor was not an easy adjustment. Uh, for him, he had some tough days. Um, you know, if you're always questioning and answering, asking why, that means you haven't bought in. You just have to, um, the word we've used for 35 years. It's not just here. It's been everywhere we've been. Kids had to surrender at Washington State. They had to surrender at Oklahoma. Um, and once LJ surrendered, um, he found out how good he can be. Um, uh, jo Jojo 
is just is just like a um, a flower in bloom. Uh, he hasn't bloomed yet, but he's going to. Uh, his his ceiling is ridiculous. Um, so all our award winners, starting with Jamal, LJ, uh, J1, uh, JoJo, and then Emmanuel and um, um, Big J. Both those guys, you know, we we can't do what we do without everybody pulling in the same direction. Uh, you see, some you, some people uh, they're like a canoe. One guy's facing one way, the other guy's facing him, and they're canoe. They're just their paddles are going in direct, different directions, and uh, all they do is wind up turning circles. So on this team, everybody's um, gone through their hard days. Um, they, they bought in. And once you buy in, you start having fun and then you realize how good a team you can be. And then the awards uh, follow. So just really proud of this team. Thank you, Randy. We'll go to Chris Gardner, please. Chris, go ahead. Coach, if you don't mind, just tell the story about the ladder that you mentioned on Saturday and was it, was it since 2014 when you got there? You mean that one? Yes, sir. <laughs> Um, well, um, I think I was in a depressed state. Uh, not really. It's kind of a form of speech, I guess. Um, when I was real, I, I, I started looking under the covers when I got here. I had no idea uh, that it was in that state, but we've talked about that enough. But um, might have been my second day. Uh, and I was still trying to hire staff, still trying to figure out who I was going to keep, who let go. I didn't know anybody. Um, but um, talking about the staff. Um, but somebody walked in my uh, office over there at the uh, alumni center and said, you have a package. I said, well, just, you know, thank you. Um, just just leave it out in the uh the off, off, uh, reception area there, and I'll, I'll just get it later. He said, no, it's not that kind of package. It's it's a, um, he said it was, uh, I don't know how tall that is, probably, but the box they had, and it looked like it was 11 feet. He said, hmm, I wonder what that is. And when he handed it to me, I saw it came from Oklahoma. Um, I still didn't know what it was, so I took a box cutter and started working on it, trying to get it out of there. Now I saw it was a ladder. As soon as I saw it was a ladder, I knew who sent it. And I knew what I knew the symbolism behind it, and I knew what it was. Because um, you know, we won three consecutive Big 12 tournaments. Uh, and then we won the uh, Big 12 regular season all in about a five-year stretch. And each time we stepped up that ladder, the guy that was standing there with me was Joe Castiglione. And he and I started just talking about the symbolism of what each step on the ladder represented. And uh, I'm not going to go into all of that, but he and I had this, you know, we talk about that. And it was a lot like building a program, you know, him running an athletic department. You know, you, you, have, you have steps that you have to take. So he sent me that ladder and I still have the uh, note. Um, I'll show, I'll show you the note. That's that's the note that came with it. I don't know if you, can you guys read it? Can you read it? Yeah, yes, sir. Okay. So it says, uh, congratulations. I, ho I, hope, I hope you'll need to use this a lot during your journey as a Houston Cougar. And that was from um, April of, uh, or first week in April in uh, 2014. So, uh, and uh, he turned out to be at least uh, somewhat prophetic because we've used that ladder a lot. Thank you, Chris. We got a Chris Baldwin from Paper City, Houston. Go ahead, Chris. Hey, Kelvin. Um, I, re I remember a few years ago after uh, Iowa Iowa won the uh, Big Ten championship, and then I think lost in the first round of the NCAA. You talked about how much. You know these conference tournaments can be sort of a mixed bag for you know the top higher ranked teams. How do you sort of 
you know, approach that and, and try to balance that? And has your approach towards conference tournaments changed over the years? No. Um, when I was a really young coach in the uh, Pac-10, no. <clears throat> You know, the, the, when I was young, I you know the jobs that I could get were the hardest ones in the league. So you you had to do a lot just to win a game. But I remember when I was in the Pac-10, uh, George Ravlin was the coach at USC, uh, Walt Hazard, and then Jim Herrick was at UCLA, Lou Olson, Arizona, Steve Patterson, Arizona State, Lou Campanelli, Cal, Mike Montgomery, Stanford. Ralph Miller, Oregon, Don Monson. Ralph Miller, Oregon State, Don Monson, Oregon. Uh, Andy Russo was the coach at um, Washington. The reason I mention that is we always had our head coaches meetings. They rotate them. Sometimes it would be at some posh resort, Tucson or Phoenix or, or, or San Francisco. Um, in the Bay Area. But I remember one year we went in and uh, Arizona and UCLA were, were loaded. I mean, they had great programs that uh, I think in 88, if I'm not mistaken, Arizona was in the Final Four and Stanford was probably good enough to get there. And we were just building brick by brick the program at Washington State. We weren't very good. Um, but they came into the coaches meeting and they talked about wanting to do away with the tournament. Because the teams that were making the tournament, the tournament ended on su on Sunday, and they were sending the West Coast teams to the East Coast. One of them had to play in Greensboro or Charlotte, somewhere in North Carolina, on a Thursday. So, you know, you're disadvantaged if you're a West Coast school. So, uh, but they wanted to do away with it because it was hurting the teams that was making the tournament. And um, uh, I started thinking about that. And, and they, um, the particulars were they needed a certain vote. I think they needed three, three or four. I can't remember. I think they had UCLA who was going to vote it out. I didn't want to vote it out because I, I, I wasn't going to make the NCAA tournament. So the only thing I had to do to motivate my kids uh, at the end of the season was, uh, you know, we. We, we've got to play our best because when we get to the tournament, you never know. You know, you got to have something to motivate your kids. So they were, they wanted to do away with it. Uh, and, and it was like a hierarchy. You know, we were down at the bottom and they were at the top and the rules were going to get slanted to the teams at the top. And I didn't like that. So I said, no, I'm not voting to do away with the tournament. We need the tournament. So for that reason, I always understand that the other teams, sometimes you just can't think about yourself. You got to think about what's best for the league. And the, these conferences, um, um, now that we are where we are, would it be better if we don't play the tournament? Sure. You, you get the rest, you, you risk an injury, all that. But you know what? That conference tournament is important for everybody. It's important for the fans. It's important for the universities. More importantly, it's important for the league. Sometimes you make decisions, not selfishly, but selflessly. And that's why I've always been pro term. Thank you, Chris. We'll go to Adam Spillane from Sports Radio 610. Adam, please go ahead. Hey, Kelvin. Uh, when you look at your offensive rebound differential and your turnover differential, you're getting like 11 and a half more possessions than your opponents. And I don't think anybody else in the country is in double digits. Um, why has that been such an emphasis for your team this season and just in, in the past? No, also? no, 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 no. It's been emphasis on my team for 30 years. This is, I didn't start this season, Hoss. Go back to the Oregon State game when we uh, beat Oregon State. Go look at the statistics in that game. Uh, look what we shot from the field. Look at our offensive rebounding percentage and look at our turnovers. So if you just started following us now, you're about 30 years too late. We've always been like that. I've emphasized that um, every year I've been coaching. The reason why is I've, I've had a lot of teams that were not good shooting teams. So what is our contingency plan? How do you win a game when you don't make shots? 
People like to call it ugly. I don't care what you call it. I call it winning. You've got to figure out how to win. And sometimes you've got to have more possessions, more shots. The more shots you the, the team that has the most shots has the best chance to win. Well, we're not going to beat team. I've only had one or two teams here that I thought could beat you on his first shot. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but when I had Corey Davis and Armani Brooks, that team could beat you with his first shot because those those two guys made around 223s combined. Like LJ's made 96 so far this year. Well, can you imagine if I had another LJ? Two guys that could shoot like that, and they they were both around. Uh, they were high volume three point shooters because that's the way we set our offense up. Um, but uh, if you're going to miss shots, which you are, all teams will. Um, you've got to figure out how to win games when you don't make shots, and that started at Montana Tech, Washington State, and I've carried it through Oklahoma all the way to here. You know, is uh, is our holy trinity. Defend, rebound, take care of the ball. If you if you're good in those three areas, you always have a really good chance to win. Victory favors the team that makes the fewest mistakes. Basketball is not a game of great plays; it's a game of eliminating mistakes. And if you can do that, if you can do that, um, especially offensively, uh, and not throw the ball away, we can rebound a missed shot. I'd rather a bad shot than a bad pass. I can rebound a missed shot. I cannot rebound a bad pass. We'll go to Josh Criswell from Cron. Go ahead, Josh. Hey, Coach. With uh, Jamal winning Big 12 Player of the Year, I was just curious, um, you know, what has it done for your program being able to go from Galen to Dejan to Jamal at that point guard position over these last few years? Well, it makes you um, – solid you know we you know every, everything for me every program i've had you know every, you we're at houston now so everything's focused on houston but it's always been like this you know if you go back and look at the point guards that i've had um of course when i was young um the only position that uh, uh i really spent time on was the point guard i always recruited the point guard Benny Seltzer was my first point guard at Washington State that I recruited. He was a 17-year-old little skinny kid out of Birmingham, Alabama, who's now the head coach, I'm sorry, the assistant coach at Texas State uh, with TJ over there, San Marcos. But uh, he he was he was the ultimate godfather. You know, Galen may be the godfather here, but Benny Seltzer was 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 the first godfather. He started, he he allowed me to build a program. We weren't very good his first year. We went seven and 22. Our two best players, one broke his arm and the other one had a, a blood uh, infection in his right thigh. And he they shut him down for the year in uh, early December. So we played the entire Pac-10 schedule that year, I think with six and a half guys. Um, so our best player became that 17-year-old freshman in the league with everybody had pros, Gary Payton at Oregon State, Sean, Ed, Sean Elliott at Arizona, um, Todd Lichty and Adam Keefe at uh, Stanford, uh, Terrell Brandon at Oregon. Everybody had pros. We just weren't very good. So we lost 18 straight games, 17 conference games. But he was my point guard, and I rode with him, and he rode with me. He stayed all four years. His fourth year, he broke Reggie Miller's all-time three-point shooting record in the Pac-10. He has since been inducted into the Pac-10 Hall of Fame. That was my first recruit, um, my first point guard recruit. Um, I set out that summer to find one position, and I found Benny Seltzer. And um, he was my guy. And then from that point over, I focused on the point guard. Uh, I didn't have – I. I I've always been consistent with that position, uh, whether it's at Washington State or um, uh, Oklahoma. I just haven't had – I haven't missed on many point guards. You know, that's that's the one position you cannot miss on. And, um, um, you know, I, I, I think we – if anything that I've taught these assistant coaches is how to evaluate. You know, everybody talks about recruiting, but it's not about recruiting. I don't want just any player. I want a guy that can play 
play for me, can play in our culture, in our system that can handle the day-to-day -day, uh, demands that that position requires. So, um, you know, um, I re recruited Galen. Galen was my guy. I, I liked him. Um, uh, Marlon Lowe, that there was a there was there were some great AAU programs here in Houston. I didn't know about any of them, but uh, Houston Hoops. I found out about them. Never heard of Houston. Well, I did hear of Houston. That's not true. I remember recruiting Marcus Spears, uh, trying to get him to play football and basketball at Oklahoma. He wound up going to LSU, but he was a good basketball player. I was recruiting him for basketball. I loved him. Um, but when I got here, there's this program called Texas Pro. They had a center named Jared Allen and a point guard named uh, Galen Robinson. And um, Marlon Lowe was the first one to tell me how good Galen was. Well, the next time I take somebody's word for something, it'll be first. I'll, 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 I'll be the judge of that. Uh, but he was right. Gail, we, we had to have Galen. So uh, the, it was uh, me and Alvin Brooks. And Al, Alvin did an awesome job uh, doing the background stuff. But I spent a lot of time uh, convincing Galen. His grandfather helped. His mother helped. Marlon helped. But when Galen made the decision to come here, he made it cool. He made it cool for Houston. Because Galen was a, a, a name on the circuit. He was somebody that people respected. And coming to Houston at that time was not very cool. We, we were terrible. Everything was terrible. Facilities were terrible. Support was terrible. Apathy was kind of rampant throughout the department. That's when we decided to cut off and be an island unto ourselves, do everything ourselves. And um, But Galen, Galen was the one. Uh, he had some tough days. Immature, hard-headed, stubborn, but he was a winner. And once he learned to uh, do the things that Jamal had to learn to do, um, it, it changed his life and it helped our program. Uh, same thing with Dejan. Um, uh, Dejan was crazy, but a good crazy. There's, there's good crazies. Um, he was also uh, all over the place. He had to mature. Um, but I, if there's any one kid that I think that I've helped more than anybody else would probably be him. And the fact that he was our point guard for almost three years. He backed up Galen or played with Galen one year. Then the next two years, he was the guy. But look at our team's success during those periods. They all reflected that position. We, we were solid. We had a point guard. Uh, from Galen to Dejan to uh, uh, Jamal. So... That, that that position has been our our rock. Um, you know, the other positions have been pretty stable, pretty solid, just like our program. Got time for a few more. We'll go to Joseph Duarte from the Chronicle, please. Joseph, go ahead. Good morning, Kelvin. Good morning. Uh, first, congratulations on your award yesterday. Uh, wanted to ask this this time of year, Kelvin. Most most teams going into their conference tournament. Uh, some are playing for positioning, seeding, that kind of stuff, trying to get into the tournament. Your team, on the other hand, with with, with things uh, pretty set for for if you if you listen to the brackets and stuff. But I was wondering, how do you approach the Big Twelve tournament in terms of uh, you know multiple games in a row? Is it a chance to to sort of get that that tournament feel, or is it just a matter of staying healthy and and getting through it to to start the following week? Well, part of our secret sauce here is we don't get too high or low about anything. You know, um, I haven't even seen the team. Uh, a bunch of them's called me. I got, I got a bunch of calls from them yesterday. Uh, um, so I haven't really seen the team. Uh, last time I saw them, they were dumping cold, cold, not room temperature, just freezing water on me after the uh, game. That that was not, you just gotta, gotta get in the right mindset to take that. I'm not sure you guys could, but you gotta be really, really locked in to know it's coming now. It, you're gonna get it. So Alan Bishop helped me. He said, coach, I'm just telling you, they're waiting on you. And I said, Which, what water is it? He said, oh, it's cold. I said, oh shit. So I took a deep breath. Walked down the hallway, 
I could hear the music. I turned left and I said, bring it on, baby. Bring it on. So I just kind of gutted that one out. But I uh like Deion Sanders, I took receipts. I got a little some I got a little something for Emmanuel Sharp. He did a few extra waters he didn't need to. Don't think I don't remember. He doesn't know I know that, but I remember it. Uh so when I when I see the team today, uh I'm gonna pull old uh Sharpmeister over to the side and said, uh, about those two extra bottles. Uh, what was that all about? And he's gonna say I didn't do it. That's just gonna be his initial reaction. And I'm not hearing any of that, but uh, uh, the old coach will keep receipts on that one. But as far as uh, the tournament, um, it's our th third season. We were 13 and 0 in our first one, 15 and 3 in the second one. Now we just start all over again. You know, we don't know who we're playing yet. We'll play the winner of uh, um, OU and TCU at two o'clock. Um, but today will be about going over the uh, – nothing changes today. We'll go over the uh, Kansas report. We'll do our analytics. We'll show them what we did good. Uh, you know, we had certain goals on the scout report. We'll see if we hit those. Um, and then um, uh, no tape today. Uh, I promised them two days off. I was going to give them two days off anyway, but I promised them two days off yesterday and today that's just for the you know we're kind of walking wounded and then we'll uh leave um we'll practice tomorrow and leave wednesday morning and uh play at two o'clock on uh thursday so i i don't see any broad picture things to bring up to them you know it's our, our next game we've we've kind of been a next game team all year long and this will be our Next game. The only difference now, if you lose, you just have to go home. Kevin, if I could sneak this in real quick. Somebody asked Jamal what the worst thing that you've ever told him was, and he brought up the uh, softer than puppy shit in the rain uh, line. I was wondering, do you have a favorite one-liner that applies to any player, or, or are these some of these one-liners specifically tailor-made for, for, uh, for, for a specific player? Well, uh, well, I think that's the worst one you can hear from me because I don't like soft. You know, I don't like kids that are non-competitive. You know, co competition is – there's a big difference in uh, playing hard versus competing. Uh, Jamal didn't know how to compete. You know, he wasn't an everyday John. You know, at some point you got to be an everyday John. Uh, J1 had to learn that too. Um, I'd say the best – Every day, John, I've ever coached was Hollis Price. He never had a bad practice. He was a grown man when he was 18 years old. Um, here, um, I don't know. I probably could think of somebody, but there's, there's nobody here to compare us to uh, Hollis, the way he was. Um, then I've had kids uh, other schools. Uh, Washington State, Mark Hendrickson was like that. Um, bunch of, we've had some guys like that, but it's, it's, it's unique. It's unique to be able to be like, to be like that, but, um, um, you know, they, as long as you keep coming to work every day, you'll eventually get it. Thank you, Joseph. Two more questions. We'll go to Chris Baldwin first and then Chancellor Johnson with the last question of the day. Chris, go ahead, please. Kelvin, um, seeing Dejan get called up by the Grizzlies and, you know, and I know he's dealt with some injuries and, you know, sort of had a long journey. What what does that say about him and, you know, how, how he stuck with it? Well, he texted me the other day and told me about it. Then he texted me back and said, I'm playing at 6 o'clock um, tomorrow night. So this would have been Saturday afternoon or Saturday night, maybe. And um, so I watched his game. And while I was watching the game, I made I was making some notes. Because I know he would ask me. <clears throat> so what I did was after the game, I screenshotted his stat sheet. Then I highlighted uh, he had 10 rebounds. I think he was three for eight uh, from the floor. Um, and he ran point guard. His team, his team wasn't very good. They got blown out. But Oklahoma City is really, really good. 
Uh, and so after the, the game, we were texting back and forth. And the first thing he asked me is, what did you see? So I told him, <clears throat> I told him what I saw. Um, and I told him I was proud of him because he played like he belonged. He didn't play like he was an awe of being in the NBA. And I would have been surprised if he had, because that's not Dejan. De Dejan had an assuredness and a uh, belief in himself that, that came out. And, you know, he was, he was a talker. Uh, sometimes he talked too much and, and I'd get on about that sometime, but uh, I'm just super, super proud of him last night. He, tearing his ACL, coming back, his dark days. Um, uh, I think it was last year during camp. I brought him back for camp so I could give him some money. And um, he just wanted to talk one day. So we closed the door in my office. <clears throat> and we must have stayed in there for almost two hours. He cried. Um, things weren't going the way he planned. It's not what I thought it would be. So, you know, sometimes you just got to be quiet and listen to them. Let, let them let them do all the talking. So I did. And um, um, I think De Dejan is a prideful young man. He loves his mother. He loves his father. He loves New Orleans. He loves his coaches, his teammates. And he, he's not very good if he's not involved in something. So when he tore his ACL, he wasn't on the team anymore. They sent him home to rehab. They didn't keep him there. He was with the Wizards at the time. And that was not, uh, he was in a bad place and I was really worried about it. But, uh, you know, our family is our family. We 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 all got him uh, through it. And to, and to sit there and watch him last night, is, it's not what it, you know, you asked me what it is. Forget, forget having a player in the NBA. It's not about that. You know, we're, we have a lot of guys that's playing the NBA and we'll continue to put guys in the NBA. But it's their journeys. It's it's what they have to overcome, you know. And I, you know, when I text these kids, whether it's Devin Davis or Bryson Gresham, uh, Fabian, Josh, uh, Justin, uh, wherever they are, you know, one of the things I make sure they understand is life is not about what you've accomplished; it will always be about what you overcome. So, being being able to overcome your challenges is far far more important than any accomplishment you will ever have. Thank you, Chancellor. Uh, well, excuse me. Thank you. We'll go to Chancellor Johnson for the last question of the day, please. Chancellor, please go ahead, sir. Hey, Kelvin. Congratulations on your award and all the program success. Um, in you. regards to uh, absolutely, in regards to Jamal Shedd with him winning now two Defensive Player of the Year awards, what does it do for your team defense as a whole when you have a guy like Jamal who can wreck a game on the perimeter um, uh, like that in uh, Jamal? Well, the best defensive backcourt I've had since I've been here was Galen and Corey. Uh, uh, Galen was an elite, elite defender. So was Corey. Um, and their strengths were different areas, but they both could sit down in a stance with their feet and keep the ball in front of you. Uh, and they were both, both tough. Um, now, Dejan was different in that he could guard a guy like Buddy Beheim better than anybody I've had. Uh, Dejan was uh, six five and a half, almost six six. He had about a six ten wingspan, and he had quick, at quick twitch, very athletic, uh, smart. Knew how to read a screen. He knew when to shoot the gap. Knew when to lock and chase. All this stuff we teach. I, I left that up to him to be able to. Uh, to do it. Now, Quentin Grimes was a better on-ball defender. Quentin could guard the other team's ball handler, whereas Dejan could guard guard the guy that came ducked in and out of screens. Um, uh, last year's team with uh, Marcus and um, um, Jamal, they were more like Corey and Galen. Um, uh, very similar. They, they were both on, on the same shelf, uh, it, it, I would say that Corey and Galen were probably a little bit better than those two because I I never felt like Jamal was an everyday John with it. That would be the difference. Galen was. But Galen, Jamal didn't hit his senior year yet. 
So I knew that the changes that he would have to make involved being an everyday job. Uh, now this year, the best defensive player that I've had is Jamal. Uh, and that's why this year's team is so good. Now, J1 is a big part of that too. Uh, the way he defends, uh, the way um, Javier, you know, in our system, they all have major responsibilities with every action that's run. And defense is just guarding a series of actions from the start to the to the horn blows on the shot clock. One of the reasons why we get a lot of um, possession turnovers where the, the shot clock runs out is we we preach and we I hold them accountable for breakdowns. If you break down, you know, like sometimes I'll put a minute on the clock. So instead of guarding a 30 second shot clock, they have to guard a 60 second shot clock. So in those 60 seconds, if somebody breaks down, we start over. You know, they can get to 50, 54, 56, boom, uh, breakdown. Start the clock over. That's not easy to do when you're having to play defense consistently for one minute, whereas in the game, it's only 30 seconds. So when you get in the game, and it's a 30-second shot clock. Come on, man. This is a piece of cake. <laughs> so, um, and that showed – uh, during the course of the year, especially early, as we got better and better and better. Uh, we were terrible in Australia, but we should have been terrible. Um, um, Australia is kind of like judging a calf when eventually it's going to become a, a, a great cow. It, it means it's too early. It's, you don't evaluate nothing. Uh, you're still learning and making mistakes. But once we got back, we got September, October, those those minutes became 40 and they get to 45 and they got to where they could get to 55, but somebody would always break down. And usually it was the same guy. Uh, for us, it was usually Emmanuel or Javier. And then LJ became the guy. LJ just couldn't sustain. He couldn't go from 30 to 40. He couldn't go from 40 to 50 because he never had to do that. But that's part of the adjustment they all have to make. But um, uh, the, the guy that was consistent during that time was Jamal. And I, and I would tell him after practice sometime, that is the only reason why you're going to be good. It's not because of how high you can jump, not your athleticism. Uh, those, those things can be positives, but your attitude toward work has to be your greatest strength. And if I had to look back to from when he got here to being the defensive player of the year, I'd say the two things Jamal learned to control were well, three things. He learned to control Jamal and then his attitude, then his effort. When those three things became his strength, he became the, the best defensive guard I've ever coached and um, the greatest leader I've ever coached. Coach, if you don't mind, I'm going to squeeze in one more question. Jerome Solomon from the Houston Chronicle. Jerome, go ahead, please. Hey, Coach, congrats on the Coach of the Year honor. Um, Thank you. You talked about the players at the very beginning of this who won their individual awards, and I know you always say it's not about you, but un something like this, it is. All the success you had at OU, you were never named Big 12 Coach of the Year. You, your competitors and friends, Rick Barnes and Roy and all those guys won it over that time. And you probably, at some point, never thought you would. Does it? What, what does it mean for you to be honored as that this year? Well, to be honest, I voted for T.J. Ostenberger. And... Um, if I'm being really, really honest here, I think he should have won the award. Um, he, he I, I think he deserved it more than I did. Um, our, our team was picked to finish high. And that's one of the reasons why you, you, you never win these awards. It's like Coach K or any of those guys. M most of the time, the guys that's picked to finish the highest never win it. But I think from top to bottom, watching Iowa State this year and the way they played, uh, and maybe it's because I I never really paid attention uh, uh, to uh, you know I didn't know a whole lot I didn't know anything about him. Um, um, really, the first time I ever met him was at the Big Twelve head coaches meetings in the uh, spring. The only thing I I just remember him being a really nice guy. Um, and then when I started watching Iowa State, uh, I had great respect for him. And then when we played Iowa State in Ames, um, I said, wow, boy, this guy's a great coach. I mean, he's really, really good. 
and then to watch where they started then to the uh, end of the season um, were, were, you know, I, I didn't know where to pick any of these teams. I They shouldn't even have me pick, the, you know, uh, actually I had Casey and Kellen as assistants. Y'all pick. I don't know anything about these teams. Uh, I don't even know where we picked Iowa State. But I noticed that the other teams picked them, uh, I think it was sixth or seventh, or something like that. Uh, and then when we played them, I said, wow, if that's the seventh place team in this league, we're in trouble. Um and then the way they finished the two times we played him, I, I just thought he was a great coach. And the fact that they uh, gave it to me um, was fine. But, I, 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 you know, being the coach of the year um, um, it is a great honor. Um, you know, coaches will always, uh, at least the ones that, that should, sh should always say it's a shared award because it, it really is. I'm blessed to have John Houston as my trainer. I'm blessed to have Alan Bishop as my strength coach and nutritionist. I'm blessed to have uh, um, my daughter, Lauren, who takes care of everything off the court and makes us relevant 12 months a year. I'm blessed to have um, a son that that eats, sleeps, and breathes this stuff like I do, and the staff that's loyal and hardworking. So my name will be on the award um, and that's great, but uh, these awards don't define me. And I guess maybe when you get old, you don't really care about that stuff that much. Uh, the fact that Jamal Shedd became an everyday job. You know, that's my award. Uh, J1 Roberts um, stayed here for five years and became a, a fan favorite and people that got to know him find out what kind of kid he is. That's that's my award. Javier um, investing in him and see see what he did. Uh, that that that's that's those are your awards. Seeing a guy like uh, uh, Terrence and JoJo and Ramon go down and a kid like Sid get an opportunity, um, and what and seeing his joy uh, in the locker room Saturday and seeing my team's joy, I'll take that joy over any award.